Welcome to Business with Beers, a podcast for business owners who want to scale their business to massively grow their income and contribution by investing in people, process, and technology. I am your host, Brian Beers. This week, I've got an amazing show with Trevor McGregor. Trevor is a world-renowned business and real estate coach. He became one of Tony Robbins' platinum certified coaches before launching his own practice a few years ago. I've had the privilege of working with Trevor one-on-one since January of 2021. In this episode, Trevor and I have a conversation about the five things that hold people back from success. And throughout the episode, Trevor drops tons of great advice on time management, creating systems, processes, and daily habits. To be honest, Trevor is the one who pushed me to start this podcast. He taught me that growth happens outside of our comfort zone and that in order to grow, I need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And so, of course, I was nervous and fearful and had my own limiting beliefs when this all started. But I now have over 30 episodes recorded, and it's been a blast creating new relationships with my guests, learning and sharing this content with everyone. So if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends, rate and review with your favorite part to help us reach more people. And if you'd like to learn more about the topics covered in this podcast, check out brianbeers.com to sign up for my free weekly newsletter, delivering content directly to your inbox. Welcome to the show, Trevor. Well, thanks for having me on, Brian. Great to be here. Hey, well, this wouldn't be business with beers if I didn't ask you, me and you sitting at a bar right now up in uh, Canada. What are we drinking? Well, I think all my Canadian fellows would like me to say some Labatt's or Molson's product, but I love a good IPA and there's just so many great craft breweries around here in Vancouver, British Columbia, where I'm from. Um, man, you can't go very far without somebody offering you a nice IPA, a nice cold, tall IPA. And that's kind of my beer of choice right now. Okay. Okay. Do you like the real, real hoppy ones? I kind of like a medium hop, you know, okay. some, some, some maybe in the middle. How about yourself? Yep. Yep. That's, that's good. I don't, yeah, I don't like the, the double, the triple, the ones that are super hoppy there. It's too much for me, but, uh, awesome. Uh, yeah. So, so Trevor, uh, is, is my, my personal um, mindset performance coach, business coach. Um, I've been working now with Trevor since January and I've had a ton of success myself and and thinking a new way and, and acting kind of at that next level. So, I mean, Trevor, if you don't mind uh, quickly, you know, sharing kind of your, your backstory and, and how you got to where you're at today. Well, thanks very much, Brian. And again, yeah, my story is, uh, it's an interesting one for sure. Like most Canadian kids, you know, you grow up you want to be an NHL hockey player. Obviously, you know, I played hockey as a kid, but I never really had the size to really play in the bigger league. So I traded in my skates for, you know, going to college, studied business, right? After college, went and worked for a, a wonderful um, hospitality company, a private company, and literally started my corporate career. And I grew through the ranks and became the executive director of operations. And, you know, I was there for a number of years when, the owners of the company, they really appreciated my you know, passion for business, for people, for all things. They invited me to invest in the company's expansion plan. Hmm. And so, Brian, I took all of my money, my savings. I cashed in my 401k. I even convinced my own parents to take out a second mortgage on the family home, a six-figure second mortgage because they trusted in me. And I shoved all that money into this you know, business opportunity. And for the first couple of years, it went well until it didn't. And we were expanding far too quickly. We were in all these major cities. I think a long story short, it imploded. And I lost all, not some, all of that money that I put into this business expansion. Oh, wow. So there I was, you know, in my early 30s, you know, going, what just happened? That caused a huge rift in my my marriage. And, you know, I started to gain weight. And I knew that, you know, I was kind of in a tailspin. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do to pay back my failed loans, let alone my parents. And literally, you know, the universe brought me what I call today um, my savior, and that was a coach. And this coach literally came in. He said, Trevor, what's happened to you is truly unfortunate, but you're still a young man. You've got a good skill set. You're married with two beautiful kids. You know, let's start brainstorming how you're going to, you know, kind of spin the table around and start paying off the loans. And I said to him, I don't know how. And he said, well, you could do this or this or this or this. And one of those options, Brian, was real estate. He said, have you ever thought of investing in real estate? I said, real estate? I don't know anything about real estate. He says, well, you can use other people's money to go in, buy a property, fix it up, either rent it out or, you know, kind of pull the equity out of it and keep rinsing and repeating. And, you know, my, my back was up against the wall. I really didn't have many alternatives. So I bought one little townhouse and I got a really good deal on it, fixed it up, 
took the equity out of that and bought a condo. And I did the exact same thing there. And then this is where the light bulbs went on. I bought my first duplex. And I don't know about you, but that's where I really discovered what cash flow was. I mean, this thing cash flowed like crazy. So I used the equity in that to buy another duplex, another duplex, then fourplexes and more fourplexes. And in literally just two and a half years, not only did I make enough money to pay back all of those failed loans, including my parents, because I had a beautiful cash flowing portfolio on top of it. Okay. And life was completely headed in a new direction. Oh, wow. Okay. And then, um, so how'd you get into to coaching your, yourself? Well, that's where the story continues because around that time I was working with a different coach from the Tony Robbins organization. And, you know, he was really helping me to up level the business and the real estate and my career. And, you know, he came to me one day and he says, I don't know if you know this, but Tony Robbins is looking to build out the business division of coaching. Would you ever consider putting in an application? And I said, oh, I could, but I don't know anything about coaching. And he said, well, literally, you can teach people what you know from your corporate life, from your real estate life, from, you know, your skill set. And Tony will help teach you all of these different concepts. And so, you know, and it was around that time, too, that I started sharing what I was doing in real estate with other people and watching them go out and have success. And I think that that little, you know, kind of, you know, thing happening at the same time serendipitously helped me to write my resume, put it on the pile at Tony Robbins and literally, you know, get access to him, his trainings, his people. And then it was an 18 month process that I had to go to all the events. I had to read all the books. I had to listen to all the audios. And even when you do that, you don't just become a Robbins coach. Yeah. You got to go do a live practicum, yep. you know, and I did my live practicum uh, 18 months later in Orlando, Orlando, Florida. And when the dust settled, Brian, not only did I graduate with flying colors, but I got offered a full-time position with Tony Robbins. Okay. And so that's when I decided to go all in. I went to work for the man, the myth, the legend for over half a decade, became one of his top coaches on the planet because I'd get a lot of real estate clients coming through Tony Robbins. And they started to ask for me by name. And it just got to the point where I was so busy working with and for Tony that, you know, I came to that point where I had to decide, was I going to stay with him or was I going to go out on my own? And that's when I literally decided to go out on my own. I opened my own coaching company called Trevor McGregor International. And, you know, from that point on, I now help business owners, real estate investors, doctors, lawyers, you know, entrepreneurs really, you know, take them from where they are to where they want to be. And I still do real estate. So between the coaching and the real estate uh, and being married with three kids, it is a phenomenal life and a very, very busy life. Okay. That's fan. That's awesome. So what does coaching look like? like what, what are some of the biggest like challenges that, that your clients kind of come to you with or that kind of surface up? And then how do you, how do you help them kind of break down those barriers? Well, it's a great question. And again, that, you know, different people need different levels of coaching because, you know, just like you, you've got a tremendous amount of experience, you know, with your, your Midas shops and, you know, with, with real estate and, you know, you're married with children, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, different people are come to me and arrive at different places, right, in their journey, whether it's in their career, wanting to get out of a W-2 and get into, say, real estate, or they want to get out of the W-2 and start a home-based business or an e-commerce business. So it doesn't really matter where people are when they come to me. My entire belief system is that they need not only psychology, but some strategy to help them go from where they are to where they truly could be. And, you know, because I've been doing this for a long time now, Brian, and, you know, I'll give you the actual statistic that I have now done over 25,000 coaching sessions. And okay. that's an actual statistic that I'd have to be an idiot not to see what causes people to stay stuck and what allows people to achieve phenomenal levels of success in business and real estate. And I've really boiled it down to identifying five key things that hold people back from exploding their business or their real estate empire. And I'm happy to go over those yeah. with you now, if you like. Yeah, let's hear them. Yeah, number one is the biggest one. And it's number that I think you're familiar with. And I think some of the people you coach are familiar with, and that is limiting beliefs, right? Yeah, we all have them. There are some sort of doubt, fear, worry, anxiety all around, you know, the fear of failure or what if it doesn't work out? What if I lose money? What if the market conditions change? What if the economy changes or all of that stuff? So what I start with is really getting crystal clear 
on any limiting beliefs that could be holding my clients back from unleashing their power. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. And sometimes from, from my experience, the, the limiting belief may just be because that's just how you've always done it. Yep. Right. And you don't even realize there's like an alternative until, you know, someone asks you the questions and maybe challenges you on, you know, is, is there another way or why do you believe that? And then the answer is just, well, that's how we've always done it. Right. It's yep. not necessarily, um, you know, the way it even should be. So, um, but yeah, that's a yeah. great one. You got, you got to get over that, whether it's, uh, any way you can. <laughs> Well, that's the law of familiarity and you're spot on, Brian. It's really, they don't know what they don't know until they know. And oftentimes people have a very myopic view or they look through a certain lens when if we kind of bring them over here, now they're going to see through a different lens. And I'm telling you, I've got this great, great quote that says, every problem is a problem of perspective, right? Okay. And the universe doesn't give us any problem that there's not a potential solution to, but sometimes we got to, you know, lift up the rocks and look under it. You know, sometimes we got to face the obstacles and go around it or over it or under it or even through it. But I'm telling you, just like I had to build tremendous muscle when I was going through my adversity, another great quote from Napoleon Hill is that, you know, adversity brings with it the seed of opportunity. Yeah. So even though I was in a very tough time and my beliefs were limited, it was that coach, right? That saw through a different lens that presented an opportunity to Getting move in a different direction. And, and here we are today. And yeah, my real estate holdings, you know, in Canada, here in Vancouver, or some of the stuff that we own in Texas or Florida, the Carolinas, Memphis, Colorado. I mean, we're all over the place in the US. Plus we've got some investments in, you know, Costa Rica and as far away as Australia. But if I would have, you know, lived in my narrow paradigm and my limited beliefs back then, um, you know, I would have never been able to go out there and expand the way that we have. Yep. Yeah. I'm a firm believer that, you know, everything happens for a reason and every negative, what appears to be negative situation, there's always a positive outcome, right? But, but you have to believe that and constantly be looking for what's the solution here, right? Not focused on the problem That's it. And, and so worried about you have no money. I got to go get a job, right? Versus even you taking that risk to say, I'm going to go and invest more money, you know, get, use other people's money. However you bought that duplex or that, that yep. first one, right? Um, Cause you saw there, there was the opportunity there. So that's great. So that's number one, limiting beliefs. What's number two? Number two, Brian, is what we call a lack of a strategic plan. Because okay. here's the truth. More people spend more time planning their one week trip to Mexico per year than they do their business or their life. And that's just a shame, right? So what we do is we start by really taking a look at, you know, what is the end goal? What is it that you're trying to achieve, right? Yeah. And then from that place, we can reverse engineer a plan to get there. We take a look at, well, what do you need to do in the short term? You know, and for short term, for me, that might be the next 30, 60, 90 days, maybe the next six months to a year. From that, we take a look at the long term. Long term for me in business, believe it or not, is one to five years. And then anything beyond that is what we call your vision for your business in your life. So we start by taking a look at exactly what do you want? Why do you want it? And you know, who do you need to be to get it? Not how to do it, but who do you need to be? And we combine that with the belief system to start engineering all the different steps that it takes to get them there. Okay. Lack of a structured plan. Yep. That's, you gotta have that strategic plan. You gotta be planning for what you got to do and have action, right? Got to take yeah. action on it. So. Got to take action on it. It's one thing to plan it, but that's further down in the five where you really get into executing okay. it. But yes. but that, yeah, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so what's number three? Well, three is an extension of two and three is what I call a lack of systems for support. Okay. Right? A lack of systems for support. Because again, we can get rid of your limiting beliefs and we can create an action plan, but you've got to create systems within the business that support that. And we always start with defining, well, what are the roles and the responsibilities? What are you doing? What are your partners doing? What are you outsourcing? Maybe how you're leveraging technology to help you create systems that are robust to, to help you achieve your outcomes. And really it's through the strategic planning and the setting up of the systems that are really the rocket fuel to the juice for laying the foundation for you to get up every day and rinse and repeat and rinse and repeat and move the business forward. Does that resonate with you? Yeah. The other thing we've noticed as our business has grown is a lot of the systems that got us to where we're at, you know, aren't the same ones that are going to get us to the next level. Cause as you, as you grow, you know, it just changes. You have more people, you know, things that were kind of manual and like, 
you know, individual, like an individual had to do the task, right? Become overwhelming when you've got, you know, you double, you double your size overnight, you know, in our case. So constant, it's also constant development of those systems to, to continually a, improve them and find new ways. So. It's a beautiful point And you're absolutely right. Because again, when we talk about the life cycles of any business, right? We always start out in what we call, you know, the infant stage. That's where we literally just start the business. And then we grow from the infant into the toddler, right? Now we're like a three-year-old running around in diapers, right? But soon after that, we move from three-year-old to like a 10-year-old kid. Mm -hmm. Now we can walk, we can talk, we can dress ourselves, we can go to school and come home. And then really from the first three phases, we get into what we call the teenage years. Yes, the teenage years. And that's a time where some people in business get a little bit too big for their britches. They're overspending. They're not really, you know, taking a look at running things as tight of a ship as they could be. And then we all wake up from being teenagers and realize that we're going to become next a young adult. And we better, you know, batten down the hatches and get back to paying attention. And then from young adult, we move into mature adult. So we really, again, go from toddler or from yep. infant to toddler, toddler to 10 year old, 10 year old to teenager, teenager to young adult, and then the mature adult. And that's when we really, really have a unique opportunity to make the most impact and the most income. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great analogy. What's number four? Four, Brian, is my favorite topic to coach and teach and mentor on. And you know this from our, you know, coaching, and that is lack of time management or poor time management okay because most people don't really ever stop to take a look at you know what they're doing and there's something i teach and you know this called the rule of 168. now for okay. your listeners who haven't heard about what that is it means that we all have 168 hours a week to do what we need to do you've got 168 hours i got 168 hours elon musk has 168 hours and so does oprah winfrey now we know that we sleep for a bunch of those hours we eat we pay the bills we play with the kids but really what are you doing with the rest of your time right so for anybody that's in business or anybody that's in real estate or anybody that really wants to be i can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that the quality of your ability to move your business forward will be in direct proportion to where you spend your time and that's why i teach the concept called the productivity pyramid and the productivity pyramid is really what I feel is a number one way to get people to really identify, you know, what they're doing with their time. So do you want to get into that? Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Cause you know, time, I think that's the biggest thing is people waste probably t too much time, right. On meaningless tasks, low value tasks. And, you know, for, even for me, it's kind of having that, that system to say, Hey, is this a task that I should be doing or sh should I delegate it? Should I give it to somebody else? Should I just not be doing it? Uh, should I train the VA on how to do it? Right. Cause e yep. even all that, it, it takes time to, it, it takes some time to invest with somebody to train them how to do it. Right. And sometimes you just do it yourself and it's like done versus it could take hours to train somebody how to do that task. And uh, I think making that decision of what things do I, you know, train and, and what things do I not, um, it is, a, is it, is a challenge. So. Well, it's a lovely piece that you bring up there because, you know, we call it the four D's of time management. So there's four words that start with the letter D, which really mean that there are things that we should do. Yep. There are things that we should delay doing and put on the back burner because there's a difference between what's urgent and what's important, right? There are things that we should delegate. That's kind of what you spoke about, handing stuff off to VAs. And there are things that we should dump all together. So as we take a look at what should we be doing, delaying, delegate, or dumping, it really comes back to, well, what is your skill set? You know, what are your, you know, superpowers? What do you love to do? And getting crystal clear on that and then identifying what you don't like to do. Because again, yep. I'm a big believer in not necessarily multitasking and trying to wear different hats. I mean, even in real estate, you know, I'm the type of guy that goes out there and loves to find the deal right? Okay. I love to raise capital. But if you ask me to underwrite the deal, it's not my sweet spot. I can do it, but not as well as somebody else that's passionate about numbers. Well, I find that if we can really identify what it is we love to do and what we're really good at, and then, you know, surround ourselves with other people that are really good at doing what they do, it's really where we cross pollinate and we're able to go further faster. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this before we get into the productivity pyramid. So like as you diversify yourself into these different things, how, how do you make sure that you don't like 
dilute the, the quality of time that you're able to put into it, right? Because it seems like the more, you know, we got 168 hours, right? The more time we spend, you know, Midas for me or real estate or, you know, this business or that business, like it, every choice we make takes, every yes is a no somewhere else, right? Yep. And and over time, then we get, we do get diluted in, in where we can focus our, our attention and our energy. And so maybe in, in your business and, and, and investing and how do you kind of make those choices to say, hey, I'm, I'm going to delegate to this or I'm going to diversify into that, knowing that, right, there's there's an opportunity there to make more money, right, diversify some income. But then if you take that same time, energy, effort, put it to something you're already doing, you know, was, is that a better choice? I mean, obviously, it depends on the situation. So what, what what are your thoughts on that that concept of dilution versus kind of going deeper into something you're already in? Brian, I love that question. And I think it's something that a lot of people struggle with because, you know, you read books like, you know, Gary Keller's book, The One Thing. And he often talks about, well, what's the one thing that you want to do? And, you know, I've got clients that all they do is real estate or all they do is run their franchise business or all they do is one thing. And then I've got other clients that are multidimensional. Right. And if you really look at people that might have one or two or three businesses or, you know, one or two or three businesses and then have real estate or, you know, they do some coaching or consulting. I'm often reminding, you know, my clients that, you know, it's different strokes for different folks. I mean, I can tell you right now that Tony Robbins has roughly 72 different companies. So his annual revenues are about five billion. Yes, with a B, five billion dollars a year. And he's got his hand in so many different things from personal growth to owning an island on on Fiji in a resort to he's into prosthetics, he's into virtual reality, um, all of these different avenues. And even to Tony Robbins standard, Richard Branson trumps that because if you look and you guys are welcome to Google this, if you look at how many different businesses Richard Branson's currently got his hand in, it's over 500 different businesses. So if you think about your question now, and we go to Tony or Oprah or Richard Branson or even Elon Musk, I know, you know, a lot of people out there are big Elon Musk fans, you know, should he be working on Solar City? Should he be working on SpaceX? Should he be working on Tesla? Should he be working on the boring company? And the answer to the question is, we have to really put on our leadership hat and understand and identify that different things need different levels of attention at different times, right? It's just like if you have a newborn baby, like I know you do, congrats again. Yep. That baby takes a lot of nurturing, naturing, diaper changes, breast milk, and cuddles in order for it to get to a certain stage where now it can play in its playpen and kind of be somewhat independent until it wets itself or it needs more food, right? So I find that even in my businesses or my clients' businesses, it's all about really understanding what is your values hierarchy and what's driving your decision-making model? Is it that you're looking to invest time in the business? Is it all about profitability in the business? Is it all about scaling the business? And so at different times, as we literally identify what we need to be doing with that, that will also factor into how we approach our rule of 168. Because again, there is only so much finite time that we can give things independently to help move them forward. So I know that's a lot, but does that land or resonate with you? Yeah, no, I think you're. I think you're right. That's it's the different opportunities require at different times different amounts of energy, and yep. um, and I think part of it is like you said, identifying even if it's the like, you know, Gary Keller talks about the one thing, and maybe it's three things, but you know, I, I heard someone else say, and I think this this applies to me, like his, his three biggest things that he focused on, like his highest value tasks as we as we get into the product pyramid productivity pyramid is, is people opportunity and, and vision. So like, yep. you know, he, he's very good at identifying who are the right people that he wants kind of on his team to then, then run these things. Right. He, he can see opportunity to say, all right, you know, that, that see an opportunity that maybe other people don't see and, and how that fits in with his business. And then obviously having that vision, the strategic plan, the, the big picture of where they're going. And then obviously the opportunities fit into that. And then the people fit into that. So uh, I love that. Yeah. I mean, the, back in the day, we used to talk about, you know, somebody was the visionary, right? Yep. And somebody was the manager leader. Now I think the book Traction really identifies, right? The same kind of thing. You've got the people that are really the big picture, the big vision folk, right? And then you've got the people that are the implementers or the, you know, folks that come in and, and, and execute on it. So, and that really does take us to the productivity pyramid. And so, For the listener, I'd invite them to think about this like a pyramid, like a triangle, where 
inside that triangle, we've got four different levels going up, yep. right? And that very first base level within the triangle is what we call the tasks that you're doing that we call low or no value, yep. right? Low or no value. And we give it a color called brown time, right? And that's really, you know, the time that you're maybe surfing the internet, watching Netflix, maybe you're doing a, a lower level task like mowing the lawn, um, doing laundry, but it's really the stuff that we do that doesn't give us a massive ROI on our time. Does that resonate? Yep, 100%. You bet. So up from there, we go to level two and level two is what we call low dollar value activities, right? And it's really the color we give to it is light green. Like it's like money, but it doesn't necessarily make you money. It might save you money. It might create systems. You might be researching data or markets. Um, you might be putting your taxes in order in case the IRS ever comes a calling, but it really doesn't make you a lot of money. That's level two. And again, we call that light green time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So low, low value tasks, but they need to get done to help, yep. help kind of the business keep going. Watching Netflix has no value. Right. But like, like you said, any, any things that are probably accounting or D, yes. right paying the bills at, at, yeah. the, at, at your business. Okay. I like to think of it like the propeller underneath the boat, right? We don't see the propeller. We don't hear the propeller, but it's really what allows the boat to move forward. Does okay. that make sense? Yep. You bet. From there, what we do is we literally shade in that middle line between, you know, level two and level three. And we really call this playing above the line because once you identify the brown activities you should be doing or not, and the light green activities you should be doing or not, we then go up to level three. And what we call this, Brian, is high dollar value activities, right? And high dollar value activities is buying an actual business. It's buying a piece of real estate. It's sending in an LOI. It's talking to investors. It's all of the things that set you up for having a bigger payday. Because again, most people get stuck in the light green tasks when the color we give this, and you know what it is, is dark green tasks, right? Just like the color of money. So the light green helps us prepare to make it. The dark green is where you go out and like you, you buy more muffler shops to add to your Midas collection. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Yep. Yes. Yeah, so that'd be the, the tasks that, you know, you're the best person to do, right? Like, like you said, writing the LOI, negotiating the deal, you know, going back and forth, the things that, you know, we can't really assign to anybody else. And it's, this is like this, your superpower lives, right? For most people in this this zone whatever that is for that person right everybody's different um but for me it's you know it's it's finding these deals or it's like you said trying to negotiate an apartment deal uh well the light green would have been everything else that goes in to evolve to maybe get to that point the research yep. you know sending out letters doing phone calls whatever it is uh that could be assigned to somebody else but once that fish is on the hook you know that's is where you, you reel it in so that's it you nailed got it. it that's got beautiful it. cool so what's after that well, the last level, number four, is that tiny little space at the top of the triangle or the pyramid. And what goes up there, Brian, is what I call high lifetime value, right? Mm -hmm. And the color that we give this is gold, like the most precious metal on the planet. It's the time that we spend with our loved ones. It's, it's you know, with your wife, with your family. It's working out at the gym. It's reading Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill or, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. It's hiring a coach. It's going to corporate events. It's going to real estate meetups. It's taking your family on a trip to Italy or Paris. It's really the stuff that gives you what I call an infinite ROI because at the end of the day, that's what life's all about. It's about having experiences. It's about going places. You know, um, all of the things that give us a feeling like we're living our life on purpose and with purpose. And so what's fascinating about, you know, number four, and that's the level we're in here, is that most people default to spending most of their time playing below the line, right? Mm -hmm. When me as a coach and my invitation to everyone is to ask, you know, who would you need to be and how would you have to, you know, show up to start playing more above the line? Because I'll tell you, Brian, after doing 25,000 coaching sessions, I can tell the quality of my clients' lives by which side of the line they're on, because the ones that play below the line tend to kind of, you know, hold back from unleashing their power. Whereas the ones that truly do play above the line, they go further faster. 
Okay. So the, the average American, how much time do you think they spend below the line? Well, you're not going to like this answer because the average American is not you. It's not me. Yep. And it's not yep. the listener nope. because the next question. So yeah, to all the people listening to this, I can tell that um, if you're following along with what Brian and I are dripping on you here, uh, you've got a unique opportunity to check in with what percentage of time you're below the line and above the line. But honestly, you know, it's really 90% of the time for most Americans is spent playing below the line. Yep. And, and, and specifically, I mean, Netflix and TV and what's the stats like 38 hours a week or some, something crazy. Yeah, you, people watch TV and, you and, nailed it, brother. It's a sad statistic. And the actual statistic is exactly that, that the average American watches 38 and a half hours of television a week. Now get yep. your head around that. That's them having the tube on for five or six hours a day, yep. which during a pandemic is even more, you know, um, expanded. And, you know, my coach, my teacher, my, my mentor, Tony Robbins, it's kind of funny, but he calls the television the electronic income reducer, right? Because yeah. people get in this comatose state, they sit there, you know, they watch all these shows or they watch Netflix and then they eat a bunch of stuff that doesn't belong in their body. And literally that process rinse and repeats itself. And then they get angry when they see someone else achieving more success. or they get angry when they see someone in better shape or they get angry when they see a couple that is literally living, you know, together in, in a better you know, way from the relationship standpoint. So my invitation to people is to really check in with how much brown time you're doing, how much light green time you're doing, how much dark green time you're doing and how much gold time you're doing and then redefine it you know, moving forward. So don't penalize yourself for what's happened in the past, but step out of the past to step into the present to create what we call the vision for the future. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. And I think once you start to, at least for me, when I learned this and to start thinking about the, the colors and, you know, what am I doing and the kind of what, what color is this? Uh, I think it's an easier, easier association sometimes in, in your brain to think, oh, this is a brown task or, you know, this is a light green or, or, um, you know, this is gold and really we should be spending as much time as we can in the gold time of, like I said, spending the time with your kids with yep. actual experience, not just watching TV together, but like, yep. you know, you have a good experience that you remember. Um, there's, there's a great book. I don't know if, if you've read it. It's called the, the Family Boardroom. You ever heard of that? No, I haven't. Book. Tell so me about it's, it. It's, it's, a, it's a small book. It's a quick, quick read. But the idea is that, you know, when you have, when you have kids, um, that, you know, once a quarter that you, you take each, each one of your kids, like one-on-one. -on -one, and you go, uh, what you spend four hours or more, but whatever the, the kid wants to do, they plan the day and there's no phones. You don't have a phone. They don't have a phone, no electronics. And, um, so you, you know, maybe they might want to go to, I don't know, go to Dave and Buster's and play this and that, or go to the park. And then maybe we're going to go to a hockey game, right. And you get dinner afterwards. But the idea is you have this like one-on-one -on -one, totally intentional time with your kid and that, um, you know, you do this kind of every quarter and it, and it helps strengthen the, the relationship. And it's not just like, oh, I'm spending time, like we watch a movie together. That's not really the same as, you know, giving their full undivided attention. And the idea is you only have 18 summers, right? With your kids before they, you know, go off and have their own lives. And um, that, that creates this, this, this bond and strength. And then by the end of it, especially, I guess when you have older kids, you know, there's, there's topics that you can start to discuss and that maybe they'll, they'll be honest with you that maybe they didn't feel comfortable um, cause now they kind of see on the same, uh, plane, you know, same playing field as, as them. So anyway, it's a great book, family, family boardroom. If I you love that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Happens. Love that. Thank you so much. That's great. And, um, you said you can even start with a, you know, I have a four-year-old, so that, that was an age at, uh, you know, and you're three, three and up, as long as the kid can pick what they want to do, you know, uh, to have that dedicated time is, is super important. That's all straight, you know, straight gold time that, you know, they'll remember, you know, for the rest of their life is these special, you know, daddy daughter days, um, so anyway, that's yeah, we call it making magic moments or having magic memories. And again, yeah, it's really at the age of three, you know, where kids start to remember, you know, their earliest thoughts. And so I love that you're doing that. And, you know, my youngest right now is five years old. And again, those are such fun ages to go off and do things that, you know, um, typical or average people would never plan doing. So I absolutely love that, Brian. Yep. Hey, so one of the questions I'd like to ask you is, is around uh, daily habits and you know, successful people, probably yourself and other people you, you've coached, you know, one of their, their traits is that they execute the same kind of habits on a daily basis that keeps them disciplined. 
uh, and then helps them kind of prep for having a, a good productive, you know, dark green and gold day. Yep. Uh, what, what are some of those habits that either you do or that you've, you know, seen your clients kind of do on a, on a regular basis that are proven to work? Oh, I love that question. Great, great thing. And it really ties into really what number five was on those five keys, because number five is really execution, right? Yep. That is, what are you getting up every day to do? right? Because we've got rid of your limiting beliefs. We've created this strategic plan. We've built out systems for support. We're optimizing and maximizing your time. And so all of that now leads to you getting up in the morning and, and you know, what do you do? So, you know, I'll speak quite transparently and personally about what I do because I get up every day, Brian, at 4.44 a.m., seven okay. days a week. Yeah. I'm not part of the five o'clock club. I like to kick their ass and get up a few minutes earlier. And when I get up, I use the restroom. I have a glass of water with lemon. And then I literally sit down and meditate in my meditation chair for 20 minutes. And I condition my thoughts in my mind before I then do my workout. And then for 30 minutes, I'm either on my treadmill, my elliptical, I'm doing stretches or free weights or something. So I've already conditioned my mind and I've conditioned my body before most people even you know hit snooze on the alarm. From there, I will watch something on YouTube or I'll watch a Tony Robbins clip or a you know, something, you know, that is inspiring. There's so much available to us where people don't take advantage of these short 15, 20, 30 minute opportunities to fuel the mind with inspiration. And then really when that's done, you know what? I have my protein shake. I sit down at my desk. I knock out what I consider important or emails or urgent and important emails. And then from there, the real estate day and the coaching begins because I'm really passionate about what I do. I coach, you know, from Monday to Thursday. And then every Friday is kind of like a real estate day and a long weekend begins, you know, with Lisa or my three sons. And, um, you know, it's really about routines, habits, and rituals. So to answer your question, I find that people that can get into, you know, high level routines, habits, and rituals have what I call the competitive edge in business and in life, right? And it's for people that wake up and, you know, they hit the alarm, they stumble to the shower, they grab their first cup of coffee, they plunk themselves down at their desk and they go, where should I start? Well, that's not a good routine habit or ritual to get your day going. So I always like to plan, you know, the week before my week starts. And I like to plan out the next day before the next day starts. So I always talk about at the end of every day, I really take a look at what have I done? What have I accomplished? How have I helped humanity? What have I done in my real estate or coaching business? And then I really take a look at what are my outcomes, you know, for that next day. And I get into this routine where I do it every Sunday for the week ahead of me. And it only takes about 45 minutes. And then every day, you know, at the end of the day, it takes maybe five or six minutes to really methodically plan out what my intentions and actions are for the next day. Okay. And that's how I do it. Do you write those down in a journal or how do you, where do you plan that out? It's literally pen and paper for me. I've got other clients that use, you know, Word documents. Some do Excel spreadsheets. Some use mind maps. Some use, you know, apps or technology. I'm old school. Uh, I like to really write things down because the more I write, the more I remember. And so it's usually just coil notebooks. And if I literally, you know, shared with you how many coil notebooks I've been through in the last 20 years. Um, I mean, if you asked me, what were you doing on I don't know, August 5th, I don't know, 20, 2012, I could literally go tell you by opening my coil notebook and looking at what I scribed that day, what I did, who I spoke to, what I did in real estate and any challenges I was facing or any wins or victories that I had. And it's been that methodical that's allowed me to really, you know, ramp up in my career, both as a coach, as a consultant, as a speaker, right, as a real estate investor, uh, my wife and I now own a publishing company and we do a lot of different things. And honestly, Brian, I don't think I would have been able to be able to execute on everything that I've got in front of me now without having the right routines, habits, or rituals or building out these systems. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, I, I follow a similar pattern and, and journal every day uh, with, you know, kind of usually a summary of the previous day and then kind of, you know, what, what the goals are. I think, if you, you know, you have goals and you, you write them down every day, you know, we become what we think about, right? And the more we you know, focus on those things, uh, and the more those, we, we see the opportunities that help make those things come true. So, uh, yeah, I'm strong, strong believer as well. It's, that's fantastic. Those we're, we're wrapping up here in our time. What, um, any, anything new and exciting in, in the pipeline that you're working on 
Um, does it continue to build out the coaching business, the real estate, anything else? Yeah, you know, obviously I'm a big believer in, you know, entrepreneurism and, and, you know, being an entrepreneur, a business owner, obviously real estate investing has been very good from an impact and an income standpoint. I think what I'm most excited about is our, our publishing company. Um, I think, you know, my wife wrote an amazing children's book yep. last year that has just taken off in leaps and bounds and it's called A New Alphabet for Humanity. So instead of writing the alphabet where A is for apple and B is for boy and C is for cat and D is for dog, she rewrote it with words that we should really start introducing to kids at an earlier age, like A is for abundance and B is for bravery and C is for compassion, D is for diversity and E is for empathy. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. And we hired one of the best and you know most unbelievable children's illustrators She's put together this book and we've already sold well over 65,000 oh, wow. copies and have become a bestseller. We sell it in America, Canada, the UK, Australia. It's really a global phenomenon. And, you know, we're currently, you know, adding other projects to that. Um, we've got puzzles, we've got gratitude journals, we've got, you know, clothing lines. We've got a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And for anyone that's interested in checking it out, they can simply go to our website, which is www.alphabetforhumanity.com alphabetforhumanity.com it makes a great gift um, it's great for Montessori's uh, daycares, kindergartens we got a lot of grandparents and parents buying it but the greatest part of it all is for every book we sell Brian, we give back and we plant a tree for Mother Earth so we've been planting trees in California Oregon Washington, British Columbia, Canada, and we've got a new partner as far away as Africa. So okay. we're really blessed and grateful to really see, hear, feel, and know that the impact model and giving back is as important as, you know, helping kids and parents and grandparents and teachers alike. But uh, really excited about that as we get ready to ramp up for the Thanksgiving and the Christmas season in e-commerce. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, my my, uh, my daughter has that book, and uh, yeah, it was it was a great experience. Re you know, reading through and talking about the concepts, and uh, you know, even for a four year old, it was uh, you know, it was impactful. So, it's awesome. Where, where can people um, kind of connect with you? Well, thank you again. And yes, the easiest way is uh, either through LinkedIn. Uh, certainly, find my profile on LinkedIn, or you can go to my website, which is www.trevormcgregor.com. That's T R E V O R mcgregor.com. And uh, yeah, if anyone is interested in finding out more about how a coaching structure works or how they can take the real estate to the next level, uh, I love meeting new people and uh, any friend of Brian Beers is a friend of mine. There you go. Well, thanks. Thanks for coming on and chatting. And um, yeah, it was great. I think, you know, provide a ton of value, ton of way to thinking, thinking about these concepts and time management and, you know, limiting beliefs and all these things that, that hold people back. So um yeah well thank you for having me on and huge kudos to you congrats on all of your success and keep up the great work brian all right thanks trevor i'll see you you betcha bye-bye now